coming. Hallelujah. So the message today is what you allow, heaven allow. What you allow, heaven allow. What you allow, heaven allow. It's time for you to take charge of your life to take charge of your finances, to take charge of your business, to take charge of your marriage and of your children and take charge of your ministry if that's for God. Take charge of your life. It's time for you to stop living life carelessly. It's time for you to stop living life as, you know, as they say, you know, tip towing through the tulips, uh, you know, it's that que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No, stop living your life like that. Listen to me. If you don't take control of your life, somebody else will take control of it. I'm going to say that again. If you don't take control of your life, there's people waiting to take control of you. And so you have to take control of your life. you got to take control of every area of your life because if you don't take control of your life, somebody's going to take control of it for you. And I want you to know, nobody's going to treat your life the way you would treat your life. Nobody's going to have your best interest as heart like you have your best interest at heart. Even within a marriage relationship. Even within a marriage relationship. There are times we're selfish. There are times I'm selfish. There are times I'm only thinking about myself in my marriage relationship. And that causes problems when we think just about ourselves. The main reason why divorce happens in relationships break down is called selfishness. We think about ourselves. I want you to know that if you're in a relationship and you put the other person first and that other person puts you first, guess what? You're both being put first. And guess, that's an awesome relationship. But we don't do that all the time. I've been guilty of not doing that. So many times, too many times to count. But I thank God she still loves me. And I still love her. But you know what I, I want to say? That the, the, the key to our marriage is not that I'm a great guy. It's not that Shelly's a great woman. A great wife, which she is. But because Jesus makes the difference. And that, that could be cliche. Oh, Jesus makes the difference. And you see, there's a lot of people that claim Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. See, because when you know Jesus, you will never, ever do anything to hurt somebody in, intentionally. And if you unintentionally hurt somebody, you are the first to say, you know what, forgive me. And when a person finds it hard to forgive, to, excuse me, when a person finds it hard to say, forgive me, you need to get to know Jesus. You need to really get to know Jesus because when you know Jesus, there's a, there's a willingness to forgive. There's a willingness to ask for forgiveness because you, in your heart, you don't want to harm anybody. You don't want to do wrong to anybody. So let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 to 19. And it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia. Upon this rock I will build my ecclesia. Now, we, we talk about, my wife mentioned about church closing down. But the church can't close down. Because this building, and we have, we, because of Catholicism, we, and orthodoxism, we are now call this building church. But the word church has nothing to do with a building. The word that the King James translators translate church because King James didn't want it translated properly, so they translated it church. Ecclesia is a civil assembly. That's what the Toronto Council does. 
That's what they do when they meet at City Hall. They're having an ecclesia. It, the ecclesia is not a religious word. The ecclesia is not a religious term. It means the coming together of the citizens of Athens or of a Greek authority. They came together to make decisions as it pertains to government policy and military policy. It was about government. It was about being in control or taking control of their civil responsibilities and their military responsibility. It wasn't about, they didn't come together, sing some cute songs, hear a cute little sermon, and go home. That was not ecclesia. Ecclesia came to set policy and government policy. And so when we come together as ecclesia, you're supposed to be learning how to rule, how to govern, how to govern every area of your life and how to govern your world around you. It's not for us to sing some cute songs, hear a cute sermon, and go and live your life and allow the devil to beat you up for the rest of the week until you come back again to hear a cute sermon that inspires you for a few days. That's not what ecclesia is. That was not what church is supposed to be. We are not puppets on a string in this grand scheme of the devil and God in a fight. I want you to know God is not in a fight with the devil. God doesn't fight with the devil. When the devil rebelled, God didn't even fight with him. He's beneath him. God says, okay, Michael, go, Michael, please, please, Michael, just deal with that. I don't have time for the deal, deal you know, just get him out of here. Get him and the third of them that followed him, just go, go. I, I don't even, because he wasn't even worthy of God even speaking to him. Wasn't even worthy, because God's greater than that. But he says, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, my assembly. And you see, what is happening, especially with the lockdown and people live streaming, now a lot of people, they're individuals that don't even want to gather. They just want to sit and live stream. They've gotten comfortable. Uh, and folks have told us, you know, we got kind of comfortable just watching live stream. But the reality, a live stream is not ecclesia. It's not church. There's a lot of folks out there that name the name of Jesus and they're just satisfied staying at home reading the Bible. But that's not ecclesia. That's not church. Because I'm not having church at home. No, you can't have church at home. That's like me saying you having, I can have church all by myself. That's not what the word means. The word means an assembly. You've got to have two or more people to assemble. And the reality is that the devil wants to convince people that they can stay home and have church, which um, you don't understand what the word, word that Ecclesia means, because it was a coming together of the citizens of Athens or any Greek city to establish governing policy. Now, you need to understand that because then without understanding that, you won't understand the next statement. It says, upon this rock, I will build my church, my ecclesia, my governing body, and the gates of Hades, Hades is the grave, where dead people go. It's the place of death. And the gates of death shall not prevail against it. Why won't the gates of death prevail against it? And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, kingdom, the king's dominion, the reign, the rule of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound by heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the word bind means that. Tristan, come here, please. 
I, I need you to visualize this. I need you to see this. Now, uh, turn around. Now, the word bind means to do this. To bind. Now, try to move. I, I mean, really try to move. And now, Tristan is stronger than me. He is. Trust me, he is. <laughs> and if we were in a fight, I'd probably more than likely lose. But I've got him bound. Even though Tristan is stronger than me, he can't get out of this. Even though you're stronger than the devil, and he binds you, you need somebody stronger. But if you, the devil thinks he's stronger than you. And you got to understand that, just stay there, that the devil, now Tristan, because I have, he's loose, he's free. He's free to turn around and hurt me. But because I have him bound, he's not free to hurt me. The devil is free to hurt you. So if you don't bind the devil, if you don't bind sickness and disease, if you don't bind poverty and lack and fear and anxiety, if you don't bind COVID-19, it's free to hurt you. Now, there are things, now understand, you've got to Bind the devil and his works, but there are things that the devil is also bound. The devil now, Tristan, is your health, it's your peace, is your prosperity. And the devil has come and bound your peace, bound your prosperity, bound your health. Bound it. How? Through sickness, through fear, through poverty, through anxiety. Has bound you. You're bound. You're heavy. Now you're stronger than the devil. But even though you're stronger than the devil, he's got you what? Bound. So how do you get loose from the devil? The Bible tells us. Whatever you bind, heaven's going to do what? Bind it. And whatever you loose, the heaven's going to do what? Loose. But you got to do it with your words. Thank you. You got to do it with your words. How does a judge give down a sentence to imprison somebody? Through what? He's got to say something. A judge has to what? Say something. In order for you to be bound... And go to prison and be bound, the judge has got to what? Say something. In order for you to be loosed from a judgment and not go to prison, the judge has got to do what? Say something. you got to say something. The Bible says, by your mouth you have been ensnared, by your mouth you shall be vindicated. And we take these words of our mouth lightly. Most Christians talk world talk, hell talk, death talk. But you're supposed to speak heaven talk. You're supposed to talk like Jesus talked. How many, how many of you read the Bible? Let me just see your hands. You read the Bible. Come on, don't be shy. You read the Bible. How many ever read where Jesus said, I'm so sick? I'm so sick and tired. Oh, that's to die for. I sure hope so. Jesus don't talk like that. But Christians talk like that. Whatever you bind. What, and the, that word bind also means allow. So whatever, excuse me, a bound means is to, to not permit, to not allow. Loose means to allow. The stuff that is going on 
in our lives, in our marriages, in our homes, with our children. We have to admit, we have allowed it. I was listening to Norval Hayes' testimony of his daughter, and his daughter had sores all over her body, and they would bleed, open sores. And he, was pray he prayed for three years for his daughter, and she got no better. And so he went to the Lord, Lord, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? God, I've been praying for three years. What am I doing wrong? And the Lord sh showed him. He said, you're the head of your house. You need to take charge of your house. Now I'm paraphrasing his story. But pretty much what he was saying is, you are allowing the devil. See, this is a problem. And I'll say it again. God is not your problem. And I listen to how most of you pray. And most of you, when you pray, you only address God. You only pray to God. If you listen to how I pray, I do not only pray to God. Because God's not my problem. I praise God, I give God thanks, but I speak to the devil. Because the devil's my problem, not God. Sickness is my problem, not God. And the reality is this, that the moment the Lord revealed that to him. God said, you better curse that thing and command it to die and get out of your house because that's your house. You're the head of your house, and you need to take authority over that. As soon as he came out of that vision, he went straight to his daughter, spoke to those, those, those growths, those sores, command them to die and get off her body. Within 40 days, God gave her brand new skin. Brand new skin within 40 days. But he prayed for three years and nothing. She got worse. She got worse. And so for too many of us, we just, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And God is saying, you bind it. You loose it. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. And the reality is this. Instead of using the authority of the name of Jesus that you have as a believer, you're just going, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. What did you see? You thank God. Lord, I thank you that you've delivered me. Thank you. You've set me free. Devil, get out of my life. And that's the problem. Most Christians don't bind and loose. They probably bind themselves, but they don't bind and loose. Let me continue. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2 to 6. It says, but I beg you that when I am present, I may not be, uh, be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against them. Who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. In other words, we don't war with flesh. We don't war with flesh and blood. And let me say this. Just like God's not your problem, people is not your problem. And that's the pro one of the problems we have. We see people as our problem. But people are not our problem. They can give us problems, but they're not our problem. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshy. They're not of this body. But they're mighty in God for the pulling down strongholds. What are strongholds? He tells you what the strongholds are. Casting down arguments. And that word arguments is reasonings. There's reasonings that come into your mind. And what do these reasonings do? They and, 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 and cast down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. God, what is God's knowledge concerning your healing, concerning your health, concerning your wealth, concerning your peace, concerning your joy, concerning your marriage, concerning your children? What is God's knowledge? But most 
Christians, unfortunately, are ignorant of what God's knowledge is. They're ignorant of God's word is. If they're like, a, you know, I grew up in a Jamaican home, and, and, and in, a, in, in the Jamaican home I grew up, they just read Psalms 91, Psalms 27, and Psalms 23. That was the sum total of Bible reading. Psalms 23, Psalms 27, and Psalms 91, because those are, you know, protection scriptures. And those are great scriptures, but that's not the whole Bible. And it does not reveal all the knowledge of God. And when the devil comes to attack you, if you don't have the knowledge of God, he's going to take advantage of your ignorance. And you're not able to, so, so the arguments, the reasonings come to your mind, but if you don't have the word of God that contradicts that, I remember that I thought being sick was normal because everybody gets sick. But I didn't have the knowledge of God that by the stripes of Jesus I was healed. The moment I got that knowledge that by the stripes of Jesus I was healed, I refused to be sick. I refuse to accept sickness. I refuse to tolerate sickness in my life. And I'm not taking medicine for any sickness for what? This 30, I may forget how many years now. 35 years. 35 years. Have I been sick in 35 years? I sure have. As they say, I've been felt like I was sick like a dog. I felt sick like I was going to die. But you know what? I stood on God's word. I said, devil, you will not kill me. Sickness or disease, you have no right to be in my body. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Thank you, Jesus, that you have healed me. Jesus, I give you all the praise. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have healed me. Father, I give you praise that you have healed me through Jesus Christ. Sickness and disease, you have no right to be in my body. Pain, you have no right to be in my body. Fever, you have no right to be in my body. Jesus, I'm healed. I declare I'm healed. But if I didn't have a revelation of by the stripes of Jesus, I was here. I would not have been able to do that. And the thought comes, you're going to be sick for a long time. You might even die. No, I'm not going to die, and I'm not going to be sick for a long time because by the stripes of Jesus, I was here. But if you don't have the knowledge of God, you're not going to be able to do that. Bringing captivity says, uh, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You've got to take the thought of sickness captive. How do you do it? You bind it. You're unemployed and the thought comes. You're sending out resumes and no one's responding. You know what thought comes to your mind? I'm never going to get a job. They're not hiring, especially in COVID-19, they're not hiring. I'm never going to get a job. You're never going to get a job. That's a thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And so what you've got to do, you've got to bind that thought. You can say, no, no. I will get a job. Satan, you take your hands off my job. You've got to tell him to take your hands off. The reason why so many Christians are oppressed because they refuse to talk to the devil. They refuse to talk to the devil. Refuse to talk to Satan. I realize I've prayed for many people with cancer, and they died. And you know what? I realize why they died. Because... They never spoke to the cancer. They never spoke to the cancer. Did they pray? Yes, they prayed. Did they believe God? Yes, they believed God. People who believed God were praying for them. Thousands of people were praying for them. They still died. Because it's not about what other people do. It's about what you do. When other people pray for you, there's no guarantee. But when you pray for yourself, when you speak the word, there's a guarantee. There's a guarantee. There's a guarantee. But you've got to take the thought captive. There are all kinds of crazy, foolish, stupid thought that comes into your mind every single day, every hour of the day, every second of the day. You've got to take those thoughts captive. 
And you know what's interesting? That most of the thought that comes into your mind, it's always about a negative thought. It's always something negative. And you know what part of the problem is? You think they are your thoughts. You think they are your thoughts. So you know what? You let those thoughts roam around in your head. You cannot allow a thought to create a full motion picture in your head. You get one thought and you start to get another one and you start putting it together. Next thing you know, you got a full screenplay. You got a big motion picture going on in your head. Instead of you say, no! <laughs> awesome word. N O. No. You need to learn that. You need to learn to start saying no. No means no. You got to tell demons no means no. You got to tell sickness no be no. You got to say, I refuse to be poor. I refuse to be sick. I refuse to be anxious. I refuse to be depressed. I refuse to fail. I refuse. No, I will not fail. No, I will not be sick. No, I will not die. No, I will not go out of my mind. No, I won't be anxious. No. You got to say no. I won't accept that. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Sin gives place to the devil. And it gives place to the devil for him to steal, kill, and destroy your life, your body, your finances, your marriage, your relationship, your children, employment, your business. The devil is a destroyer. And if you let him, he will destroy you. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10 and 11 says, Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I've forgiven anything, I've forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay, what do we learn from that? If you are ignorant of Satan's devices, he will take advantage of you. And what did Jesus say the thief comes to do? He comes to what? Steal come to kill and it will destroy listen to me satan shows no mercy you can't negotiate with demons they don't negotiate the devil is wicked the, jesus says he's a murderer from the beginning you don't negotiate with murderers he will show you no pity. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. The devil will not feel sorry for you. So stop feeling sorry for yourself. So don't be ignorant. The only way not to be ignorant is to get into the word of God. That's how you not be ignorant. You need to know the knowledge of God so that every thought that comes against that knowledge, you're able to bring it captive. You say, I bind you. No, you're not going to have that in my life. The devil tempts. We got to be real. The devil tempts. Tempts us to do all kinds of things. Tempts us to commit adultery, fornicate, do all kinds of stuff. And you got to say, no. No. And this is one thing that I, 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 I just saw this as I was studying. Paul says, indeed, I have forgiven anything. If I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan. So in other words, I've forgiven you, lest Satan. So in other words, if I don't forgive you, then Satan will take advantage of you because of your ignorance of the sin that is unforgiven. In other words, the sins you have in your life that you are ignorant of, Satan uses it as an opportunity to take advantage of you. Take advantage of you. And so one of the things, when you're praying, and you're praying to God, and you're praying, and nothing's happening, one of the things you need to ask yourself is this, God, is there any sin in my life that is unforgiven 
When I mean unforgiven, it does, I'm not saying that God hasn't forgiven all your sin. I, what I mean is it's unconfessed. It's not been dealt with. And so you keep doing it and giving the devil place for it. Let's look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 to 10. It says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, fellowship with Jesus, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, in other words, we walk in the knowledge of his word, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. So we've been cleansed from all sin. But watch this. If we say that we have no sin, wait a minute, didn't he just cleanse us from all sin? But if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It doesn't matter what you do or have done. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why? So that the devil won't take advantage of you. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. What does that mean? It doesn't mean like, um, the time I spent in the Baptist church, they told me I had to ask for forgiveness for every day. And so every day when I went to pray, when I started to go to Baptist church, I would get down on my knees and say, oh, God, forgive me for any sin that I committed today. Then the next day, oh, God, whatever sin I committed today, please forgive me. Oh, can you imagine me going to my wife? I hurt my wife. Hurt her badly. And so I go to my wife and say, forgive me. If I hurt you, forgive me if I hurt you. Is that an acceptable? Is that really asking for forgiveness? That wouldn't be acceptable. Because if she came to me and says, you know what, um, forgive me. Uh, my first question is, forgive you for what? What did you do? <laughs> because if you don't acknowledge what you did is wrong, you won't do it again. Now, ladies and gents, don't do this. I'll forgive you if you promise never to do it again. <laughs> you know what my answer to this? I can't promise you I will never, ever do it again. <laughs> if you're going to forgive me based on the fact that I'll never do it again, you're never going to forgive me because more than likely I'll probably do it at least one more time again. It's unreasonable to ask another human being to promise that they will never, ever hurt you again. Because they may hurt, not hurt you the same way they hurt you this time, but they may hurt you another way the other time. Sometimes we make unreasonable requests on other human beings. But when you're praying for something, you're standing in faith, believing for something, and, and sometimes you see it's a struggle. Sometimes you have to take a step back. And say, am I doing something that's giving the devil place? And it's nothing wrong with that. But what you don't want to do is this. Start really psychoanalyzing yourself. Don't do that. You just talk to God and allow the God to speak to you. Because if you start looking into yourself, you know what you're going to see? Darkness. <laughs> That's all you're going to see. Nothing. There's a darkness. You say, Lord, if I'm doing something that's giving Satan a place to take advantage of me, Lord, show me. Or if you have somebody you trust, someone you know you can trust them, and they have your best interest at heart, you can speak to them and say, you know what? Is there anything you, that I may have a blind spot? Is there anything that I do that is not pleasing to the Lord that you see me do, but because you're, you're afraid that I may get upset at you or, or, or get upset that you point out my faults that you don't say to me? If you have that person in your life you can trust by you, talk to them. Because we all have blind spots. We all have blind spots. Now, please just do that to someone you trust. Because you say that to the wrong person, 
and they might put off a, by the time they're finished with you. <laughs> you wonder if Jesus even loves you. <laughs> You have to root out every known and unknown sin out of your life so Satan does not use it as a means to take advantage of you. Ah. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 and 9. <laughs> so be so or be vigilant because your adversary, your adversary, the devil, God's not your enemy. God's not trying to hurt you. God's not trying to kill you. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Tell him no. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, there's nothing you're going through that somebody else isn't going through. I know you're special, you're unique, but you're not that special or unique. There's nothing that you have ever experienced that somebody else in the history of humanity has not done. Do you know what an awesome thing is? There's nobody that has your faith. There's somebody that may look slightly like you, but nobody on this planet has your exact faith. Even twins don't look exactly 100% alike. No one else has your people. In other words, no one else on this planet is you. Twins don't have the same spirit. Twins don't even have the same personality. You are unique and specific. There is nobody that was ever created that is like you. You are the only you that will ever be. I'm going to say that again. You are the only you that will ever be. You, there's no carbon copy, but unfortunately, we all try to be carbon copies. Whether in how we dress, and how we talk, and our hairstyles, and whatever we do. But I want you to know, you are the only you that there will ever be. And that's why Satan wants to get you to kill you, to destroy you. Because once you are destroyed, there will never be anyone in the history of the planet that's going to be like you. You are unique, distinct, and special. But having said that, your life experiences are not unique. There is nothing that happens to you that somebody else, I mean, you may, not, you, it may feel like it, they know, nobody knows. The troubles I've seen, nobody, no, somebody knows. <laughs> somebody has experienced it. <laughs> but how we deal with it is unique to us. So he's saying, listen to me. Anything you've gone through, the devil has already tried that trick. He doesn't have a new trick. He's already tried that trick on someone else, and you can overcome it. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. Let's give him a clap offering. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Your ignorance of the word of God and who your enemy is is allowing the devil to take advantage of you, to steal, to kill, and to destroy your life, your body, your finances, your business, your marriage, your children, and understand that because of your ignorance of your authority, heaven will stand by and watch the devil steal, kill, and destroy your life, your body, your marriage, your relationships, your business, heaven will just fold its hands and watch. Well, what do you mean heaven will fold its hand and watch? Yeah, heaven folds its hand and watch. That's why so many Christians die. That's why so many people die. That's why so many Christians are broke. That's why so many Christian businesses fail. That's why 23,000 churches close down. Heaven will just stand 
and watch. Why? Because I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind, heaven binds. Whatever you loose, heaven will loose. Behold, he said, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. You will cast out devils. Why do you need to cast out devils? Because the devil wants to kill you. The devil wants to steal from you. And if you keep your mouth shut, the thief will come into your house and rob you blind. And nobody will do anything about it. When the thief breaks into your house, you hiding up in the closet. Oh, please, God. Please, God. Please. No. Who's in the house? Oh, there's somebody here. It's like that commercial where you now have the video <laughs> and person knock on the door and you're, you're, you're in Jamaica. You pull up the app on your phone and you see somebody else. Who are you? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Why? Because they think somebody's in the house. Well, you're thousands of miles away. Uh, by the way, I got you on camera. I'm recording right now. <laughs> you're thousands of miles away. What's the point in Thieves like darkness. Thieves don't operate in light. Why? Because they don't want to be found out. But the moment they're exposed, it's like cockroaches. I'm not trying to say human beings are cockroaches, but a thief is like a cockroach. When the lights are off, they are all over the place. Thank God I have no cockroaches in my house, but... I've been there. <laughs> and as soon as you turn that light on, angel. <laughs> They're just gone. <laughs> but I tell you what, you got to shine a light on the devil. You got to shine a light on the devil. Ephesians 5, 10 to 3. I gotta move quickly. I'm running out of time. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the, the wiles of the devil, the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, you stand by you stand. How do you stand? You stand by binding and loosing. What did I just say? Ephesians 5? Oh, okay. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. It's Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. That's what was on. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. My apologies. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles, the schemes, the strategies of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Again, people are not your problem. And this will save so many marriages, so many relationships. If you recognize people are not your problem. When Peter said to Jesus, no, Lord, we, we, we can't have you die. He says, get you behind me, Satan. You mind the things of men and not of God. Was Jesus calling Peter Satan? No. But please, husbands and wives, don't use that with your spouse. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it will create more problems than it solves. Do not say <laughs> when your <laughs> spouse has an issue, get you behind me, Satan. Don't do that, no. But you got to understand who your enemy is. Let's look at this final scripture. And I'll read through it quickly because time's going. Luke 4, 1 to 14. I'll read through it quickly. It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, that, uh, every, every word of God. And so you see, the devil speaks to him, 
And what does he do? He talks back to the devil. He didn't go, mm, 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 mm. Uh, I, I don't hear the devil. I don't hear the devil. There's no devil. The devil don't exist. No, no. No, he didn't do that. He talked back to the devil. Then the devil take him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship, worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Now get out of my face. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge of you to keep you. The devil's trying to get... How many of you have ever been on a balcony and the thought comes into your mind, Why don't you just jump? The, the, the thought comes to your mind, Just jump. And, 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 and... You know, most of us have sense enough to know. I mean, I, I didn't know to rebuke the devil because I didn't know it was the devil at the time. But I said, I ain't jumping over no balcony. <laughs> but you see, if you've been depressed long enough, if life has been bad long enough, if you've been tormented long enough, and the devil starts putting thoughts in your mind, to tell you you have no future. How can you continue to live this way? You will give in to it if you have nothing to combat it, to come against it, and you think it's your thoughts. Listen to me. It's contrary to nature for you to kill yourself. Because if I came up to you and went like this, your first reaction is to do what? To block my hand. In, in you is to protect yourself. And so for you to kill yourself is totally unnatural. And so you know it's the devil. First of all, it's not your life to take in the first place. And he said, they will keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has, been, it, has, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by God. So quickly, there's two things I want to bring out of this as I close. One, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if you're going to effectively fight against the devil, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be filled with the Spirit of God because he's greater than the devil. And so you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Holy Spirit last week. But you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the second thing is, it's not enough to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It helps. The second thing is this. You've got to be ready and willing to talk to the devil. You've got to be ready and willing to say no to the devil. No to that thought. Bring that thought captive. You, that thought... I don't know about you that there are times when my body's been under attack and you're, you're feeling pain in your body. And where do your mind constantly go to that pain? And when you're in pain, it seems like the pain is never going to stop. That, that sickness is never going to leave. And it becomes a battle in your mind. And so you have to make up in your mind that if the sickness is going to talk to you, talk back to the sickness. If fear is going to talk to you, talk back to the fear. You got to talk back. If defeat and failure is going to talk to you, talk back to it. That's what Jesus did. And so it's time for you to take up your authority. Take up your authority as a believer. Now, unless you're not a believer, then you don't have authority. If you have not made Jesus Lord of your life, then you don't have that authority. But it's easy fix. Make Jesus Lord of your life. Receive the forgiveness of sin because sin gives place to the devil. And as long as you are, are a sinner, a slave to sin, the devil will wreak havoc in your life. It doesn't matter how much money you have. 
We met this man the other day. He's a, he's, he's a wealthy man, but he says, what use is all my money and I can't enjoy my wealth? I'm sick. And, he, and he's a young man. I realize the guy's only like two years older than me. He looks a lot older than me, but he's like two years older than me, and he's ready to die. Because to him, why well, have all this money and you're sick? You can't enjoy it. That's why God says, I want you to what? Prosper in all your business and financial affairs and be in health even as your soul what? Prospers. How does your soul prosper? Through the forgiveness of your sin. And so if you've not been filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the second thing is, you need to know that you have authority in Jesus' name to tell the devil to stop harassing you, get out of your marriage, devil, take your hands off my husband, devil, take your hands off my wife, devil, take your hands off my children, devil, take your hands off my money, devil, take, come on, stand with me just now. Let's do this. No, keep at it. Six on? Could you unmute six? Okay. Could we have just some music just in the background? Yes. Amen. Uh, in my heart, I just hear the Holy Spirit saying to encourage you. Now, some of you have been praying for your loved one for a very long time, and you're not seeing a result, and you're getting tired. Wives, you're praying for your husband. And you're not seeing them changing, and you're saying, or you're praying for your wife, and you're not seeing them changing. And you have even said, but the goodness of God leads men to repentance. God has been good, but they're not changing. You're getting tired. You're praying for your sister, your brother, your mother, different one, and you're still not seeing change. The Lord says, don't give up. Do not give up. The commandment of the Lord is not burdensome. It's not hard. We get tired because we're looking in the natural. I heard this in my heart. Someone dying is not the worst thing that can happen to them. Someone dying and being separated from God for eternity is the worst thing that can happen to them. I'm challenging you like myself. That if we don't pray for our loved one, they said the God of this world have blinded their mind. Blind people have no sense of where they're going unless they've been led by someone or an animal. 